Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's broadcast of the State of Clean Energy. Today we have our co-host Sharon Moriwaki uh, from Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. My name is Jeff Ono. I'm an attorney at Watanabe Ng and a poor excuse for a substitute <laughs> no. for Jay Fidel. No, no. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have our special guest, Mina Morita, former state legislator, uh, former chair of the Public Utilities Commission, and now a consultant in um, energy issues. But before we get to our special guest, we have uh, the Negawatt moment. Hawaii Energy's Negawatt moment. We have Karen Iha here to tell us Hawaii Energy's community involvement. Yeah. So, of course, April is Earth Month, and um, we've been really busy with Hawaii Energy. We've been out there in the community trying to get some energy efficiency pro um, programs going, and we've been out there in the just in the community just doing regular just um, community service. So this past Saturday, a few of us went down to um, the Kaneohe side and went into the Lo'i and helped pick weeds, you know, and got in the mud and got down and dirty. But yeah, it was really yeah. fun to be out in the community and representing Hawaii energy. So it's not just energy stuff. Not energy. just energy stuff. Just yeah. Yeah, energy a in everything. a different oh, way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're out there doing energy savings too. So we're out in Waianae with Catholic Charities. Um, and just helping them with their shelters, trying to get um, energy savings for them, water mm -hmm. savings for mm -hmm. them, and um, we have a little clip for you too. Okay. Okay, let's look. Welcome to Hale Vai Vista, one of a number of Catholic charities, Hawaii shelters, transitional housing, and affordable permanent housing complexes, where Hawaii Energy is working to help substantially lower energy costs. It's just such a, a close-knit community lifestyle here. Uh, we wanted to go ahead and preserve that in, in also in trying to alleviate some of the energy burden that they might have. Uh, have in uh, their situation, whatever it may be. Uh, again, through the just very simple energy efficiency measures, we realized that we could make an impact on both their monthly income and their utility bills. Oh, this is so important. Um, it's so important for not just for the families, but I, I think also for the environment itself. You know, it, it saves, it um, helps a lot, it saves a lot, and it educates, you know, people on the importance of conserving and saving energy. Meanwhile in town, Hawaii Energy performs the same types of retrofits at Catholic Charities Hawaii's Hale Hualoha, a three-story, short-term housing facility that helps struggling families get back on their feet. Well, the residents are like single moms, so their um, budget is very limited. So whatever they can save on energy, water, and and for Catholic charities because we own the property. If you have all the, uh, the measures installed by us, uh, which is the water measures and the uh, lighting re retrofits, typically a uh, two bedroom, one bath uh, unit could save about $160 a year. The cost of living, the electric bills, you know, it's just so expensive. So, you know, that's what Hawaii energy does, you know, really, really appreciate it. Well, if you guys are interested, please call Hawaii Energy. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been out there with Boys and Girls Club of Hawaii, Boy Scouts of America on the Big Island. So we've been around and, you know, we really enjoy being out in the community and really serving the people who, 
you know, need to be served. So how, mm -hmm. how does my charity um, get one of these offers? Give us a call, give, us our, give our office a call anytime or send us an email and we'd be glad to do um, just a walkthrough and see what we can do as far as energy savings. So anybody can know. call? Yes. And what is that number to call? And it's area code 808-839-8800. I just want to make one pitch for Hawaii Energy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, as a former consumer advocate, people wonder what that public benefit fee is on, on their bill. Oh, yeah. It goes to Hawaii Energy. Energy efficiency benefits everyone. Yes. So thank you for what you do, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, and thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Justine Espiritu, and I host the Hawaii Food and Farmer series with my co-host Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. Every week, we bring on farmers as well as all the other individuals and organizations that help support a thriving, sustainable food system. In fact, it's interesting to learn what others are doing so you don't have to be a Hawaii resident or producing food on Hawaii to be featured on the show, like today's guest, Wyatt Bryson of Jewels of the Forest and Microlab Solutions. Aloha, thank you. It's been a pleasure being on the show. Um, I love uh, seeing what you guys do and I really support your mission. And uh, it's really nice being back in Hawaii. And uh, thank you again, it's an honor. So you can see guests like Wyatt every Thursday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Well, Mina, <laughs> we're here to talk about House Bill number 1580. Uh -huh. Can you just tell us briefly what House Bill 1580 is? Well, it, through its various reiteration, I think what they were trying to do is establish a, um, a, a goal similar to the renewable portfolio standards for um, transportation. And... Uh, it's in conference right now. I haven't seen the conference draft, but uh, I think the basic concepts, concept from its inception was it, uh, transportation targets for uh, uh, the elimination of fossil fuel types of fuels. Just for ground transportation. Just for Just ground, for ground. Yes. Well, I mean, that sounds like a great thing to do. I mean, do, do you think uh, there are benefits to having a bill like this? Well, I think, you know, it's useful to establish benchmarks moving forward, but, um, okay, this is my personal view. <laughs> That's why we have you here. <laughs> for, for something like the renewable portfolio standards, it's became, it be, it, it's sort of difficult because, you know, you have an aspirational goal in statute, and, and really when you start uh, putting these benchmarks in statute, it's actually the floor, not the ceiling, and the floor to develop markets or, mm -hmm. or, or incentives to move in a certain direction. And again, not the ceiling, just the floor. Well, so what are the, what are the potential negative consequences of doing that? Well, I think, you know, especially for transportation goals, ground transportation goals, it's sort of difficult because um, Unlike the electricity sector where the electric utility is responsible for hitting these benchmarks and they're held accountable for these benchmarks, on the transportation side, um, there's no entity that is responsible. And a lot of this is driven by, by consumer choices, you know, what kind of vehicles you want to drive, um, the cost of fuel. Um, you know, what's available, and, you know, Hawaii is not known to drive markets. You know, larger states like California, um, you know, big countries like China, India, you know, they're seen as the real mm -hmm. drivers for, for the transportation sector, um, and, and we go along for the ride. So mm -hmm. I think that's some of the difficulties that we face moving forward with these kinds of um, uh, uh, goals in the transportation sector. What about on the positive side? Do you think that it will get consumers to say, hey, I'm going to get out of my car? <laughs> uh, because, you know, I think in Hawaii especially, um, people are so wedded to their cars because they have to take 
trips everywhere and take grandma here and the children there and they have soccer and all of that. So what, um, what if any benefit might there be? Would it send a message, hey, you know, get out of your car or, you know, what can be done or what can government do or what does it make government do? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of focus on early adoptions and wanting to provide incentives for early adoptions like more electric vehicles. But, you know, there's a, there's a larger issue here that as we go forward. You know, many times these um, early adoption policies keep rewarding the same people. <laughs> you know, like, for example, with rooftop solar, you know, you have a certain segment of the population that took advantage of this, but again, it's only a small section of the population, small segment of the population. And, and then you, you know, these same people are taking advantage of the, the electric vehicle um, tax credits, uh, rebates, and, and, and you know, it's likely that these same people, if we have uh, a, a separate energy storage tax credit, will benefit again. So I think the larger issue here is what kind of policies can we develop that are truly transformative that really benefit everyone in the, in the state? And, and you can go ahead and say it, you know, you're talking about the wealthy, uh, <laughs> that segment of the population. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah kind of like the one percent, but here, you know, at least 25 percent of, for example, electricity customers benefit from. But, uh, but where ground transportation is concerned, you know, we need to have the necessary infrastructure if we're really going to switch away from uh, petroleum-based fuels. Mm -hmm. So how do, we get, how do we get that infrastructure in if we don't, you know, plan ahead and uh, make mm -hmm. sure that, uh, you know, it's available so when people want to buy the electric car, they know there's going to be a charging station available? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's one problem that needs to be addressed. But I think there's a larger issue um, with regard to transportation fuels. And it's the whole fuel infrastructure that has been an ongoing problem for us for many years. Uh, if you look at how the refineries were first um, developed, it was efficiency was the most uh, uh, you know, top of mind, you know, how do you get these refineries to operate as efficient, efficiently as possible to process that barrel of oil to be used in the state? Um, now with different technologies coming in, different customer pre uh, preferences, the desire towards a low carbon, no carbon future, you know, the, the, uh, the operational efficiencies of, of the refinery is being challenged. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, what, less than three years ago, we we're looking at one or both refineries going out of business. We have two new owners of refineries. So what's the dynamics happening there? Um, we had the refinery task force um, report that came out. None of the problems regarding the fuel infrastructure has been addressed, and, mm. uh, and I, I think, you know, we really have to look at the bottlenecks there, because if we're looking at importing fuels, we have some um, barriers as to the importation, mm. the storage of fuels, which, you know, relate to um, security issues, fuel security issues. We started, we started the series with the question of the fuel uh, refinery task force and and what the report was and where are we do we have to go back to it um, you know in terms of you folks being on it that task force and where I was where, it Jeff was <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, where where is that and do we need to return to it or are we you know are we beyond it um, you know what what are the issues that we should start looking at now for the mm -hmm. future mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think, again, you know, it's, you know, we do have this desire towards more renewable fuels, but I think um, a major objective for us is 
feel diversity and cost uh, and low carbon or no carbon. So how do we take those goals mm -hmm. and incorporate it into whatever fuel infrastructure that we develop? And you know, one of the things we've learned over the last four weeks in, in this program is that you know each of these industries affects the, the mm -hmm. you know the energy sector in another industry. So whether we're talking about mm -hmm. motor transportation, mm -hmm. um, airline transportation, last week we talked a, a little bit about maritime transportation, the electricity sector. They all they're all interrelated, and they all mm -hmm. affect what what happens at the refineries. Sharon, you're with the the Energy Policy Forum. You know, do you feel that we have adequate planning in this state for, to, that incorporates all of these v various sectors? No, and I think this is why we keep harping on the need for better planning and getting together and, and having a discussion. Um, there, there was um, an interest by uh, Department of Transportation pulling together the Clean Transportation Forum or Sustainable Transportation Forum where they had, but it's primarily focused on ground transportation, although uh, we heard from Daryl last week that the marine transportation and looking at the mm -hmm. infrastructure in the harbors, as well as, you know, we haven't talked about air, but air um, is also an important uh, factor, although we don't have as much control. All of that is, is intertwined and, and we really need to look at planning from a broader perspective and mm -hmm. a bigger framework than, right. than we have now. Um, we've been talking about this for years, yeah. I think. Yeah. We talk about <laughs> energy efficient transportation. And I think at one point we're saying, well, how do we create a transportation paradise? Uh, and that was in 2009. Yeah. So, you know, we really do need to have better plans and some targets, but more, um, reasonable and looking at it more comprehensively. Well, well one of the things HB um, 1580, you know, calls for is a working group to, to set some goals. So, Mina, is, you know, is that adequate for, for the kind of energy planning that you're talking about? No, I think there has to be more emphasis on, on energy planning and um, it, it has, you need, um, interagency cooperation, uh, cooperation between the public sector and the private sector, and political will. And w I, I think we need the recognition that this isn't a simple problem, and this has to go beyond political cycles, um, that this is a massive planning endeavor that goes beyond political cycles where major investments need to be in made and so you have the two refineries about to make significant investments in upgrading their facilities. We need to give them direction on, on what we anticipate for the future that they can have some certainty in as, as they make these investments. Um, it's not only the two refineries, but you also have Hawaii Gas um, in the same situation. Um, and again, while, while it's nice to have a focus on um, renewable fuels um, and no carbon fuels, you know, there has to be this realization um, of what's practical, what's pragmatic as we, as we move forward. You know, uh, for a lot of our, especially commercial industrial needs, there's no substitution. Um, and, and so, I, again, how do we move forward with a no regret strategy that lays the foundation to take us to a low, no carbon future, um, you know, as we move forward? Sure, yeah, we're, we're not going to be experimenting with the, with the airline industry on, mm -hmm. on, with fuels. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to be dependent yeah. upon jet fuel, petroleum-based jet fuel for a long mm -hmm. time to come. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, if our tourist industry is going to continue, we're, we're going to need to have sufficient quantities of jet fuel here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think, you know, the focus needs to be on, you know, what are the cleanest fuels that we can um, either uh, produce locally or import that will give us competitive pricing and really give us uh, uh, better efficiencies and um, uh, reduction in e emissions. Well, well, I guess 
maybe we started looking at what if we were to dream forward, what would be the the framework or what would we need to be looking at or who should be at the table to provide that leadership so that we are going with forward, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of having the kind of infrastructure needed, in terms of having the the, um, the parties all at the table knowing what's ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's where the market is also needs to be involved with what the state is envisioning for the future, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and how how might we plan that, or how might the state plan that going forward? Right. I think you know, um, Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism always had a real significant role in energy planning, and that energy planning was was the entire energy ecosystem. Um, you know, they've come up with some really big strategic plans that happened, um, I think, almost 10 years ago. I don't think we've mm -hmm. seen any significant updates to, to the energy mm -hmm. strategy since then. Um, there's been a lot of focus on electricity, and definitely electricity has been that disruptor in, in you know, kind of uh, moving away from that efficiency of that barrel of oil. So it's it, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, how do we update these plans and how do how do we address the the the, the issues that were brought out in the refinery um, task force uh, findings that that were pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things the refinery t task force concluded was that by 2020, which is only three years away, <laughs> that one or both refineries would shut down. And I think in the previous shows, so, you know, we've c kind of concluded that maybe we have a reprieve. We've mm -hmm. got low oil prices, yeah. um, we have new owners of the refineries, and so that, that 2020 date might be extended out sometime in, you know, mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the, 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 the bottom line conclusion that one or both refineries will eventually shut down in the near future has changed. Mm -hmm. So, what, you know, what should we do to plan for that? I mean, you know, there, there were conclusions that were made, recommendations made in the task force report. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there's been very little follow-up. Right. What right. do we need to do about Do we reconvene the task force? Mm -hmm. I, I, I would think so. I would hope so because, I, again, the function of the refineries might change. I mean, they may not be refinery, mm -hmm. refining, but they may be importing. And you know, you, you, you can't deny that there are far more efficient refineries out there, far more cleaner refineries out, mm. out there. And I mean, we have to look at things. Um, we, we have to balance energy security against the fact that it may be cheaper for us to import fuels uh, so rather than that refining. The refinery doesn't close down, but it shifts in function and what, what it does so yeah. that, you know, looking to the future, it's what is the function that we want to save? Mm -hmm. And it might be, you know, something's cheaper and cleaner and mm -hmm. how do they shift so that they're looking to the future, but they need some, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of message, right. <laughs> you know, beacon, we're, we're going to go. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, the key issue that um, this lack of awareness of the all this interdependencies um, that involve the refinery and, and um, companies like Hawaii Gas. Let me know. switch subject just a little bit, because, but you had talked about pragmatic solutions. Mm -hmm. There are some people who say, you know, we're just missing the boat when we keep talking about petroleum-based products. Mm -hmm. The key is hydrogen. What, mm -hmm. what do you think about hydrogen? Are, are, we, are we, you know, missing the boat by not looking at hydrogen and really investing in hydrogen technology? Yeah, uh, well, I think it's with any um, technology, it's, uh, it, things are advancing and it's, it's when do you make your significant investments. And, and we all know that it may not be the right time to invest in fuel cells except for specific um, uh, 
situations where you may get really good value. Like, for example, if you really want that reliability and you're willing to pay high dollar for that uh, reliability, maybe fuel cells is the right um, uh, solution for that specific circumstance. But in general, the timing may not be right. And, and um, so timing is everything. And but how do you set up the, the, your foundational structure so you can enter at the right time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that is a challenge. Yeah. That is a challenge. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I, you know, I'm a big hydrogen proponent from the early 2000s. And, you know, I always saw it as a uh, means of energy storage for um, the amount of renewables we have here um, through electrolysis and mm -hmm. and so you know I'm still hopeful for that hydrogen vision um, but again timing is everything and and as we move forward we have to make significant investments in new infrastructure so we have to be really cognizant of cost issues on consumers mm -hmm. We've got about a minute left, Sharon. Do you want to summarize our, our, our April hydrocarbons and clean energy? Well, thank you, Jeff. This was a really great series on hydrocarbons. You know, we've been talking about this, and now we're going to shift to renewables. But we brought out the realities of, of mm -hmm. looking at the infrastructure, looking at all the, the parties involved, uh, and, and really the need for real good planning going yeah. forward. And, and I think the leadership to, to you know say, okay, this is the foundational issues that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So we have to come back again and do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, in 10 years, and we'll do it again. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Thank, thank you, Mina. Yeah. No, thank you. So are we going to... Um, oh, and next week, oh, and next week we're going to start with the legislature and what happens. So Mina is going to be coordinating all of that and coming in <laughs> next week. So you want to tell us a little bit about the series with one second left? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, it's sort of a legislative wrap-up on, on energy policy. And, um, you know, granted, not too many bills moved. So it's uh, talking to the watchers people who are watching this legislation and, and getting their input, talking to the makers, the legislators that were involved, and then uh, touching on the implementers, those that have to implement the laws a as we move forward. So that's how that Great. series is kind of shaping up to be. It's going to um, be exciting. It'll be good yeah, to hear. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and hopefully, sides. you know, even though we just ended this legislative session, you know, we always have our eye on the next the session. Next session. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Sharon, and, and, and our friend Jay Fidel for allowing me to co-host oh, these last four been shows. It, it's thank been you. a lot of fun. Thank, Aloha. thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you. <laughs>